Good morning, everyone. My name is Patricia Gonzalez Guerrero. I'm a postdoc at the Computer Architecture Group in the Applied Mathematics and Computational Research Division. Um, so, I'm showing you here a plot in the way axis. I'm showing you the computing performance. In the x axis, I'm showing you the year. And you can see that around 2003, uh, the growth in computing performance kind of stopped being what we expected. Um, and this happened because basically we reached uh, the fundamental physical limits of our current technologies. So um, there are a lot of people right now working on how do we respond to the need for faster and more powerful computers now that we have reached these fundamental physical limits. So there are many avenues to answer this question, uh, but one of those avenues is looking into alternative computing paradigms. Um, no, sorry, well, alternative computing paradigms and alternative technologies. And one of these alternative technologies is superconductivity. And this is one of the most promising, um, you know, because I've been working on that, so I'm biased. Mm -hmm. But um, the idea of this talk is that I want to tell you very quickly what are the advantages of superconductivity and how can we address the challenges of the technology. So let me tell you very quickly what is superconductivity. So here in the y-axis, um, I'm showing you resistance. And on the x-axis, I'm showing you temperature. And you can see that if you lower the temperature enough below a, a critical you know, temperature, the metal is going to go, the resistance of the metal is going to go to zero. And that physical phenomenon is what we know as superconductivity. This phenomenon is leveraged by an active device that is called Josephson Junction, or you know, like a more familiar JJ. And if you, the, the interesting thing about the JJ is that, is that if you push a current through the JJ that is larger than the critical current, it's going to give you this little pulse. And this pulse is what we call a single flux quantum pulse SFQ. I'm going to repeat this word a lot during the presentation, so keep it. Uh, but the idea is that it oh, is only 1.2 millivolts tall, and it is very fast. It's only 5 picoseconds wide. So this enables us that to run very, very fast and to, and to exp spend very little energy on the computation. So people have been working in logic families, and with these logic families, we have built um, you know, computing elements, multipliers, others, nodes, like what you need to build a computer, right? And we have demonstrated, I mean, people have demonstrated that we can run 10 times to 100 times faster than current technologies, and that we can achieve 10 times lower active energy than, than, than current technologies that is CMOS. So just to finish my pitch, so you guys all start working on superconductivity. Um, um, someone did this uh, projection some years ago of what would a superconducting computing look like. And they compared it with the Titan um, computer at Ordenel that at that time was the, you know, uh, the second com fastest computer in the world. And you see that you can achieve a comparable performance, but you can, um, but this superconducting computer would uh, take, you know, uh, 100 times less, um, um, less power, uh, on, and it would occupy a fraction of the area. So, okay, so everyone is ready to start working on superconductivity, but I'm, I have to tell you the problems, right? And um, so, okay, so here is a state of the art RSFQ chip. And you can see that on this chip, uh, you can only fit one multiplier, which requires a, a, a around 17,000 JJs. So if we compare this with the silicon chip that we have today, uh, uh, that can fit 64,000 multipliers, you can see that we have, there is a big gap that we need to fill in in order to do this superconducting computing. And that's where my research comes in. So I believe that biologically inspired computing is the answer to leverage um, the superconducting ideas. And that's why we came up with unary SFQ. So in unary SFQ, basically, we represent data in a different way. So let me tell you how we represent data. First, we're going to uh, represent data in the temporal domain. So basically, if I want to represent the number 3, the SFQ pulse is going to arrive at time 3. The other way I can represent data is in the, in, a, in, a, in the frequency of a pulse stream. So if I want to represent the number 1, I'm going to use the maximum frequency. If I want to represent 0 0.5, I'm going to use half the maximum frequency, and so on. I think you guys get the idea. Um, and then with this data representation, I can build things. I can build multipliers. I can build others. I can build nodes. I can build things to, do com to build computers. So what is interesting about this is that if I compare my unary SFQ multiplier that I built I'm sorry, that I designed 
um, it requires only 63 JJs, and when I compare it with the 17,000 multipliers that I need for a, for, for a binary multiplier, you can see that I'm actually, you know, gaining 90% of savings in area. So, so I basically, you know, tackle the, the challenge, right? So I'm, I'm getting more computing out of a JJ. So here I'm showing you uh, uh, in the y-axis area versus the number of bits, and you can see that for a binary multiplier, the area increases with bits, but for a unary, I can play with the resolution of my computation using the same hardware. The, the area is the same, so which is another advantage. Okay, so I build other, other computing elements, I build others, I build uh, pulse stream generators, I build memories, so, so I have kind of the building blocks to do more interesting things. So I start to do more interesting things, right? So I, I looked into digital signal processing, I look into network and chips, I look into machine learning, and I look at and, and, and how like the architecture for all these accelerators, and I of course have to evaluate them, right? So I'm not gonna go into the details of all these, but then okay, so yeah, so fast Fourier, finite impulse response, hyperdimensional computing, convolutional neural networks, you know, networks on chip and things like that. But now, if I want to evaluate this, I'm, I'm not going to go into details for everything, but, but let me just give you some ideas. So if I want to compare my approach with current approach CMOS, I'm showing you here in the y-axis the speed up uh, versus the number of bits, you can see that I can reach uh, up to 10 times of a speed up, uh, sometimes a little bit better uh, with my approach. And the other interesting thing is that if I, if I plot the area efficiency versus the number of bits, you can see that with my approach, I can reach up to 50 uh, mega operations per second per JJ, while with the binary approach, this is less than one mega, you know, less than one operation per JJ. So you can see that I'm actually with unary computing tackling the big challenge of, of superconducting computing. So in overall, uh, unary SFQ will give us better area density as we looked, but it also has a, another interesting approaches that is, that is more resilient to errors than a binary approach. And also, that is, um, it, we can reach um, comparable or better throughput. We are not sacrificing throughput when we compare it with CMOS. Um, just to finish, um, I want to um, you know, like clarify that all this work was designed, was circuits that we designed using spice level simulations. And then all our spice level simulations information with, were fed to higher level models so we could have all this evaluation. But we are very excited, we would be very excited if we can take all these ideas and actually fabricate and test these unary SFQ prototypes and then plug it into other applications such as cryogenic sensors, which is very promising, control for quantum computing, which could be very useful, and ultimately HPC accelerators. Um, yeah, so thank you.